Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. Revolution 250 is a consortium of about 70 organizations looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution's 250th anniversaries. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group. I also teach history at Suffolk University, as well as the Harvard Extension School. And I am delighted today to have with us Emily Parsons. Emily is the Deputy Director and Curator for the American Revolution Institute at the Society of the Cincinnati, actually at the spectacular Anderson House in Washington, D.C. Emily, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So the Society of the Cincinnati is a venerable institution. It's been around since 1783. Can you tell us a little bit more about who they are and what they set out to do and what they do? Of course, yeah. The Society of the Cincinnati is our nation's oldest historical organization, as you said, founded in May of 1783 at the close of the Revolutionary War. Um, it was the brainchild of Henry Knox, who saw a need for an organization to perpetuate the memory of the war for independence, maintain the fraternal bonds between the soldiers who had fought for as many as eight years of that war, um, promote the ideals of the revolution for future generations, um, support the war's veterans and their families in need. Um, in that sense, it was also our nation's first veterans organization. Um, and advocate for the compensation promised to the officers by Congress that had um, languished during the last years of war. Um, okay. The society since its beginning has been a hereditary organization so that descendants of those original officers um, and future generations around the country would keep alive the memory of the patriotic sacrifices that have made, made American liberty a reality. Um, so those original members were um, about 2,200 American and French officers, veterans of the revolution, um, and certainly um, bringing the French in as original members of the society to acknowledge that alliance that was so crucial to win the war. Um, our first president general was George Washington, a sort of natural connection, having been commander in chief of the Continental Army. Um, he served from the society's founding in 1783 until his death in 1799. And the position of president general um, was for a long time a life uh, appointment. Mm -hmm. Not so anymore. Not so. It was since about 1950. Um, it is a three year term. Okay. Um, so now, the, the members are all men. Is that right? Okay. Yes, they are. Which uh, gets so us the, to, yeah, uh, no, go right we, ahead. Don't need to, we don't need to argue the point now, um, because you, the, the society is one of the oldest historical organizations in the country, but then you're also involved with one of the newer history organizations, the American Revolution Institute, which the society created about 30 years ago. So can you tell us a bit about the American Revolution Institute? Sure. And in, it's in fact newer than that. Um, just in the last 10 years, um, okay. 10 years ago, the society created the Institute, um, which is really our public face now for our mission related public programs. So and really it it uh, just put a sort of more accessible name on activities we were already doing on our museum and library work, our exhibitions, our public programs, our classroom resources. Um, and instead of having to introduce ourselves to people or even, you know, put ourselves up on the website and, and various other places where we may not physically be in front of someone to explain to them what the Society of the Cincinnati is, what does Cincinnati have to do with anything? We're not headquartered in Ohio. Uh, we don't have to <laughs> get through all of that before we actually get into the meat of what we do. Um, the American Revolution Institute, mm -hmm. um, really hopefully makes that much more obvious um, to people yes. so what we're of, all about. Yes. And so it is a division right. so of So you society. have tremendous collections. Okay, good. And, and you have tremendous collections. That is, you have a library, you have maps, manuscripts. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what you've been, what you have in your library? Of course, yeah. So um, our library collection is in so many ways the heart and the core of what we do and enables us to do um, what we do. And, and our collections, I'll say, um, we try to put at 
uh, we, we try to incorporate those into as many of our other programs as we can. Um, our classroom programs, lesson plans, things like that. We really try to, you know, children's programs, you, you know, mm -hmm. we try to introduce our collections and those physical items um, into those programs. Um, but our, our collections certainly date back to 1783 when the society started um, certainly creating its own, what we think of today as the Society of the Cincinnati Archives. Mm -hmm. um, so documents about the founding of the society from George Washington and Lafayette and Rochambeau and Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, you know, all of those names. Um, Pierre L'Enfant's original drawings for the society's insignia and certificate of membership and medal um, are part of those archives. So that's really the beginning mm -hmm. of it. Um, really, I think through into the 20th century, our collections grew by virtue of our members and things they had inherited from their ancestors who served in the revolution, which were incredibly fortunate um, mm -hmm. to have benefited from. So whether it was orderly books or commissions, um, printed works like Steuben's Blue Books um, that later descendants donated to us. Um, what's really remarkable about that is that so many of them ended up with a provenance of ownership of these Revolutionary War officers mm -hmm. by way by the way that they descended in the families. Um, wow. In more recent years, especially in the library, we've um, been able to really have this period of extraordinary growth since mm -hmm. about 1988, when our Robert Charles Lawrence Ferguson collection was founded, uh, which is the core collection of our mm -hmm. library, uh, focuses on particularly the art of war in the 18th century and the military um, people and, and events of the revolution. So um, whether it's printed books, mm -hmm. manuals, um, both from Europe and America, um, uh, orderly books is, a, is an important part of that collection, the day-to-day -day, um, orders and activities um, down kind of on the unit level um, of what, what the American army in particular was, was doing, how it was operating, mm -hmm. uh, what soldiers were reading, what officers were reading and recommending in order to try to create a professionalized army um, really out of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, to win the war um, has become a real strength of ours. Right. Um, so certainly manuscripts, maps, mm -hmm. uh, engravings and other um, graphic arts, works on paper. Right. Um, and then when you get into our museum collections, you know, painting, sculpture, armaments, mm -hmm. artifacts, things like that. Mm -hmm. Tremendous stuff. And you do a lot of, you do a master teacher seminar every summer and you do other programs really to highlight things, uh, actually not just the things, but the story they tell. Can you tell us a little bit about the Master Teacher Seminar? Of course, yeah. So um, I think it's in something like its seventh or eighth year now. Um, it has been virtual the last two years, but we're returning to in-person this summer. Um, so it's a week-long program um, in residence at Anderson House um, for about 12 to 15 um, secondary school teachers from around the country um, history teachers mostly, um, and they come and have um, usually about half a day of conversation and instruction about various aspects of the revolution, how they teach um, various things about, you know, their own experiences, um, teaching about the revolution in their states. Um, and they, a, a big part of the experience is for them to work on a lesson plan that either mm -hmm. they've already um, been working on or creating or something entirely new and use the resources, particularly of our library, mm -hmm. um, but also our museum collections. And again, we're really encouraging them to use the material culture of the era to mm -hmm. expand on and, and really bring to life, hopefully in their classrooms, these events and, and these people. Um, so they spend intensive periods of time doing research in our mm -hmm. library and in our collections. Um, and we also try to partner with uh, related organizations in the DC area. Um, lately, it's been Ford's Theater to sort of extend the legacy of the revolution mm -hmm. to the Civil War period. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through other themes as well. Um, mm -hmm. But um, and, and those experiences have certainly broadened our network of teachers. Mm -hmm. um, they've also 
um, expanded our offerings when it comes to lesson plans. Um, some of the ones that we have on our website for general use for anyone to have um, have been created by our master teachers. Wow, that's great. So you're headquartered actually in Anderson House. Can you tell us something about Anderson House? Sure. So is, for anyone who knows Anderson House, it's not what maybe you would expect an organization that spends so much time hmm. talking about the 18th century. Um, but it's a wonderful National Historic Landmark Gilded Age mansion in the DuPont Circle neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Um, it's a wonderful location. We're right on Massachusetts Avenue at the beginning of Embassy Row. Um, the house was finished in 1905, and it was originally the winter residence of an American couple, Lars and Isabel Anderson. They were and who are they? Who they were very, very wealthy, um, uh, patriotic um, uh, citizens. Um, Lars Anderson was uh, originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, Isabel, um, born in Boston to um, important New England families. Um, both of them brought wealth and status to this marriage, but Isabel much more so. Um, uh, had a, a significant inheritance of about $5 million um, when they married, um, which really helped to build Anderson mm -hmm. House, which was one of three homes that they owned. Um, it was the most grand. Certainly one of its purposes in Washington was to help further Lars's diplomatic career. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up U.S. minister to Belgium and ambassador to Japan in the early 19-teens. Um, so to maintain those connections to mm -hmm. official Washington, um, and entertain there around in this a very European style house mm -hmm. um, with Flemish tapestries, European furniture, Asian decorative arts and sculpture um, was a huge interest of the Andersons um, with their time they spent in Japan and, and other parts of Asia. Um, they also both were um, incredibly committed to their um, ancestors in America mm -hmm. and um, the the old American families they had descended from. Um, Isabel counted, I think, no fewer than eight um, patriots in the Revolutionary War um, mm. among her descendants. I was a proud member of the DAR and actually their librarian general in the 1920s. Uh, Lars Anderson um, was descended from a Virginia officer, Richard Clough Anderson, who was an aide to camp to Lafayette on the campaign to Yorktown and um, ended up becoming an original member of the Society of the Cincinnati. So four generations later, mm -hmm. Lars Anderson joined um, the organization as a hereditary member. And of all of the organizations that they were involved in, all these patriotic organizations and, and the various philanthropic causes that they supported, the society really was at the top of the list. Um, mm -hmm. Lars Anderson had its insignia incorporated into decorations of the building. Um, and they had no children, and so the society ended up being um, a, a huge beneficiary mm. um, and Lars's will um, donating Anderson House to the society. Wow. So it, wow. it has been our headquarters since 1937. Wow. It's a great place. Now, of course, here in, uh, in Brookline, just next to Boston, mm. there's Lars Anderson Park, and their transportation museum houses his collection of automobiles. And he was... Uh, a, a tremendous collection of er, very early automobiles. Because, and in Anderson House, they actually have maps of places he would take people on auto trips through Virginia and Maryland. Yes, yes. Um, that was an important part of their lives. They really embraced, I mean, for as much of their lives and their identities, I think, that were um, maybe more conservative. Lars even described himself as old school at one point, um, but they embraced the technology of their era. Mm -hmm. They loved automobiles. Um, they, when they built Anderson House, um, it had central heat, it had electricity, um, it had telephones and elevators. Um, so that in that way, and, and certainly with the cars, um, they really mm -hmm. loved that sort of sport <laughs> as it sort right, of right. Out. Yeah. in the early 20th century. Um, but the connections, you know, certainly with the Andersons in Boston and then in that area, um, the Lars Anderson Auto Museum in Brookline, mm -hmm. even at places like Arnold Arboretum, right. which houses a bonsai collection that the Andersons mm -hmm. assembled, which uh, was also, I, I think, rather um, noteworthy for their period. Right. It really was. So they are part of the Society of the Cincinnati and 
when does the Cincinnati actually make Anderson House their headquarters or their home? Um, it was in the late 30s. Um, so Lars Anderson died in 1937. He was 10 years older than Isabel. So mm -hmm. she went on to live actually until 1948. Um, but she, um, I think Lars, Lars thought, thought of Washington as his home. Isabel, I think mm -hmm. was still, her heart was still in New England. Right. So she kind of tidied up the estate and went back to, to New England um, after his death. So by 1938, she had signed the deed of gift, um, donating the house to the society. Um, so in 1938, it was officially the society's headquarters. Um, and just the following year, 1939, they opened the house as a museum to the public for the first time. So pretty quickly, uh, mm -hmm. World War II, unfortunately, put a hold on the intentions the Andersons or the society had for Anderson House, um, especially in Washington and the need for office space. Um, it hadn't really exploded mm -hmm. in the number of government buildings we have today. Right. And so it actually became um, a, a offices of the U.S. Navy, various branches wow. of the Navy, occupied Anderson House until 1946. Um, wow. And then the society, I think, really could move in. Mm -hmm. um, so really started um, em embracing the house as its headquarters um, in, mm -hmm. in the, in the later 1940s. Um, and so it's been the center of our um, both our historic fellowship of members Mm -hmm. um, all descended from those Revolutionary War officers, as well as our public mission and programs um, ever since. Now, the programs you have do a lot, they focus on the revolution, and they're all available. Many of them are available on the website. So even if we're not able to go to Anderson House, we can participate vicariously through the website. Can you tell us a bit about some of the programs that you have coming, forthcoming, or favorite ones from the past that we could check out on the mm -hmm. website? Oh, good. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for sharing the, the homepage of our of our um, one of our two websites, actually, um, American Revolution Institute dot org, which is where you will find um, in one place all of our particularly Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. American Revolution content. And that does include a good number of several dozen um, in full recordings of our public programs. Um, so for years, we've been doing uh, lectures, authors, talks. Um, and even uh, object-based presentations we call Lunch Bites, 30-minute um, mm -hmm. presentations about um, treasures from our collections, many of which are not currently on display, but we bring out and, and you can get your noses up close to them and really do a deep dive into what these objects are, mm -hmm. um, which we have been doing virtually for the last two years. Um, April 1st, we are planning to, go, to return to in-person programming. Um, but I think like a lot of organizations, what we've really learned <laughs> recently um, is the importance of making that kind of content available online um, mm -hmm. and even live streaming and making it possible for people who aren't physically in the D.C. area, mm -hmm. can't come in person to Anderson House to see these things in person, but um, could participate live. We're going to be doing more of that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Our goal is to, for all of those historical programs, um, to have a live stream option and to put the full recording on our website um, okay. afterwards okay. for use. Um, so, you know, we've had some really wonderful historians. Um, Mary Beth Norton was actually the last in-person program we had in very early March in 2020 mm -hmm. on um, her book um, about the year 1774. Right. Um, and programs that have really tackled, you know, um, topics large and small, all related to mm -hmm. the revolution and its legacy, um, oftentimes drawing inspiration from our exhibition theme of the moment. Um, we last year did a couple panel discussions that I thought were really great. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was on the French experience in the Revolutionary War in America, looking particularly at memoirs and journals and the writings of those French officers. Mm -hmm. um, we happen to have a, a really extraordinary collection in our library of original manuscript journals, um, including Rochambeau's. Um, and mm -hmm. so our library director was one of the panelists, um, Bob mm -hmm. Selig, a historian who's worked a lot on the, the French um, experience in America during the war. Um, and Andrew Wolfstein from um, the Ann S.K. Brown um, collection mm -hmm. at um, Brown University, which has a great mm -hmm. military, um, great military holding. So that was one. 
Um, another one that we held last year, panel discussion, I'd really recommend um, was um, about a book, Espionage and Enslavement, that was about, um, it was a, a collaboratively written, I think, by, um, by two or three authors about the experience of an enslaved woman um, during and just after the revolution. And um, she was in New York and then transported to Canada and um, interacted with um, various um, figures in the Culper spy ring in New York City. And mm. um, and one of these these figures who had an extraordinary experience herself, but also crossed paths with much better known names. Um, and mm. so it is a is a great interesting a great look at that period. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we have coming up, um, I think one of our focuses has been on um, providing a platform for authors of new books, particularly mm -hmm. new scholars, you know, authors that maybe the, their first book um, and be able to highlight their work mm -hmm. and their research um, and, and even scholars in progress. Book hasn't been published yet, but mm -hmm. You know what is you know what what are they finding and and how is their um, their project mm -hmm. progressing? Um, so so we're doing doing more of that. And one of the exciting yeah. things that um, that the virtual platform has provided us is to bring in scholars who we might not do from partic particularly Europe <laughs> might not yeah. fly them in just for a right. Thursday evening presentation. But right. um, for example, Richard Middleton, who just wrote mm -hmm. uh, the biography of Cornwallis, is going right. to be on March 2nd, doing a Zoom mm -hmm. program live from England with us. Great. So we're excited about that. Great, great. We're talking with Emily Parsons, who's the deputy director and curator for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, where she's been now for 19 years in a terrific place. And we've been talking about what the American Revolution Institute does and what the Society of the Cincinnati does. Now, before we move on, you noted that Lars Anderson was actually born in the city of Cincinnati. Can you tell us a bit about the connection between Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Society of the Cincinnati, where you are every day? Sure. Yeah, it's it's a great coincidence, actually, <laughs> that Lars's family is from Cincinnati. Um, actually, since the 1820s, um, his grandfather and namesake, the first Lars Anderson, um, was the first of the family to go to Harvard, which also became a family tradition. Um, and he so the, the Revolutionary War officer, Richard Clough Anderson moved the family to what would become Louisville, Kentucky after the war. And he was actually in charge of managing and distributing um, the land grants for the state of Virginia um, that mm. had been awarded to veterans of the revolution in these Western lands. Um, so, so this first Lars Anderson grew up um, in, in what would become Kentucky, went to Harvard, ended up settling in Cincinnati, Ohio and married into the Longworth family, which was also the beginning of this sort of family tradition of, mm -hmm. of advantageous marriages. Um, so he married Catherine Longworth, the daughter of Nicholas Longworth, sort of founder of this, this important Ohio family, mm -hmm. um, who ultimately in our Lars's generation would produce another Nicholas Longworth, who was Speaker of the House um, and husband of Alice Roosevelt. Um, right. So more, <laughs> more important connections there. Yeah. Um, so the, the Anderson family really um, became an integral part of Cincinnati sort of society. Mm -hmm. um, Lars's father, Nicholas Longworth Anderson, um, was a soldier and a lawyer. He ended up serving, among many other of his family members, in the Civil War. Um, he served in an Ohio regiment, uh, mostly in the Western Theater, attained mm -hmm. the rank of Brigadier General by Brevet at the very end of the war. Um, and... It was actually right after that, 1866, that our Lars Anderson was born, technically in Paris, France, oh, wow. um, while their parents, his parents were on a sort of year and a half long honeymoon trip. Mm. Okay. So actually, we do even have in our collections um, his sort of birth certificate mm -hmm. signed by an official at the American embassy in Paris to give grant him American citizenship since mm. he was born abroad. But he did grow up in in Cincinnati until he was a teenager when his family moved to Washington. Um, one of the, I think, pieces that really connects all of these subjects that's at Anderson House is one of the murals in the second floor key room 
and the walls and ceilings are covered in murals by H. Siddons Mowbray, the Andersons commissioned. And the four walls are covered with sort of imagined scenes, but of these important events in the history of the Anderson family that ground them in these, this, the sort of military and patriotic history of the American nation. And one of them is a view of the city of Cincinnati. Um, mm. And I think Lars envisioned this both as important, certainly in the history of his own family and his own life, but connecting that to um, the society. So what's the connection between the city of Cincinnati and, and the society? Um, well, it's one named for the other? Yes. Um, but the, the ancient Roman figure Cincinnatus is really okay. the founding of all of it. Um, okay. So the society took its name, and this was Henry Knox's idea. The society took its name from Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, who was this mm -hmm. 5th century BC Roman general. And he had twice kind of come out of retirement to lead Rome's armies against foreign invaders. And both times, um, the Roman Senate asked him to become um, the head of, of Rome. And he re refused both times, saying he just wanted to kind of do his duty, serve Rome, and then go back to retirement to his mm -hmm. farm. Um, this story was made, was written about even in the ancient world by Livy and others, um, but mm -hmm. particularly in the 18th century, uh, was well known among educated Europeans and Americans, um, appeared in various history books, would have been taught, you know, as part of classical history um, to well, who would become leaders of, of the um, revolution in America. And so Washington, even at the time, was called the American Cincinnatus. And so the, the um, comparisons between his story, that he was sort of this reluctant revolutionary, left Mount Vernon to serve mm -hmm. his country, kind of throw off these foreign invaders, and at the end, retired his commission, retired his power, re relinquished his power, went back to his farm. Um, those comparisons, that mm -hmm. sort of citizen soldier ideal service to the state, this kind of mm -hmm. selfless patriotic service without reward mm -hmm. um, was, was held up as this ideal at the time. And not just for Washington, the society, um, the name, you know, they made it plural, Cincinnati, um, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just Washington. It was all the men who left their lives, their civilian pursuits, their positions, their families to join this, um, join this army to, to found the American nation, right. to make us independent. And then like Washington put down their arms and go back to their farms or to their mm -hmm. shops or, or their lives um, and subordinate the military to civilian rule. Um, mm -hmm. That was the importance of Cincinnati um, to the society and to 18th right. century America. So the society gets its name, the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783. And I think it's by 1790 that the city of Cincinnati changed mm -hmm. its name to Cincinnati because of the society and, and then in turn in honor of Cincinnati and this ideal. Right. Um, and and a, an important figure in all this is Arthur St. Clair, mm -hmm. who was the governor of the Northwest Territory, which included Cincinnati at the right. time. He was the one I think credited with renaming the city, he happened to be a member of the Society of the Cincinnati himself. Wow, thank you. We're talking with Emily Parsons, who is the deputy director and curator of the American Revolution Institute at the Society of the Cincinnati. And appropriately, we're talking with her on February the 22nd, which is, of course, Washington's birthday. And now you, when you reopen on April 1st, you're going to have a new exhibit up. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, um, our museum finally reopens April 1st, um, and our new exhibition will be called, is called Saving Soldiers, Medical Treatment in the Revolutionary War. So we'll be looking at, particularly in the Continental Army, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the phys physicians and surgeons um, whose work it was to preserve the health of soldiers. I think it's some, a, a phrase that we've really latched on to from Benjamin Rush's treatise um, that certainly surgery and battlefield wounds, you know, that's that's what we think of those kind of dramatic scenes and so almost kind of horrific situations um, that happened during the revolution. But the bulk of that work of keeping a healthy army in the field was preserving their health, um, staving off illness, keeping camps clean, 
um, really fostering the health of the soldiers in that way. So uh, we'll be looking at through portraits, through medical treatises of the time and manuscript works. Um, we'll be looking at um, the experiences both of the um, physicians and the soldiers themselves um, of, of medicine and health in the revolution. So how does someone go about visiting Anderson House and seeing the exhibit or see going into the library? Um, so when we reopen, we'll be reopening with our standard hours, um, which is Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And Sundays, 12 to 4 p.m. Um, we're free admission. And we, when you come, um, we do tours of the first and second floors of the mansion. So you'll see um, the house largely as it was when the Andersons lived there um, with additional um, collections on display and certainly interpretation of the history of the society and its importance um, and the importance of the revolution to us. Um, and we do, as you said, have a temporary exhibition gallery um, where these exhibitions are on view and you can browse those when you visit um, on your own. Hmm. Wow. And it really is a spectacular place well worth visiting, the Anderson House in Washington, D.C. Anything else we should talk about, Emily, since we have you here? Um, well, I will say, you know, like all other organizations who work in our subject matter, we are um, starting to plan for the 250th commemorations of the revolution um, that really are already ongoing. Um, in 2020, we started doing, um, in a small way, I think one program a year that looked at the anniversary, 250th anniversary mm -hmm. of an important event of that mm -hmm. year. Um, this year, coming up in June, we'll be having a historian talk about the Gas Bay incident in Rhode Island. Oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. Actually, I think just a day removed from its 250th anniversary. So those programs will become more frequent. Um, one thing I will say um, for, for those maybe familiar with um, some of the planning going on, especially on the national level, I know the National Commission is really only looking at 2025 and 2026. Mm -hmm. Um, and once the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence happens, they're kind of waning in their activities. Mm -hmm, yeah. We are fully committed to seeing this good. all the way through to 2033. Um, the Declaration, of course, is an incredibly powerful and important document, but it didn't mm -hmm. it, in and of itself secure our mm -hmm. ability to build right. our independent nation. So for the next right. seven years, you know, we'll be seeing it through to the 250th anniversaries of the end of the war, as well right. as the founding of the society in 2033. Right. Great. And you have tremendous maps and other uh, maps, as well as military artifacts in the collection, which are, uh, and, uh, you know, John Adams always said that the revolution was accomplished before a drop of blood was spilled at Lexington, and then the war for independence mm -hmm. began. And so you really have that story of the war for independence told through all these terrific resources in your collections. Oh. Yes, that's really been been our focus for um, at least the last several decades, if not the mm -hmm. last two centuries. Right, yes. So we've been talking with Emily Parsons. By the way, I once had the opportunity to speak at the society. And just before I went on, the person hosting me said, you know, Winston Churchill once stood where you're going to stand and speak. <laughs> and it didn't really help. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you think you're, you're standing not only in Washington's shadow, but in Churchill's. It's a tremendous place and well worth visiting both for Anderson House as well as for the collections of the Society of the Cincinnati and the American Revolution Institute. So thank you, Emily, for joining us and telling us about this terrific place and good luck with the reopening. We'll look forward to seeing it. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. You know, we do have folks listening from all over the world and uh, here in Massachusetts and Malden and Gloucester and Dorchester, as well as in Uzbekistan and the Czech Republic and Chonburi and Thailand and in Guam. I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank Emily Parsons from the Society of the Cincinnati and the American Revolution Institute and Jonathan Lane, our producer, the man behind the curtain. And now we will be piped out by Dave Emmerich, Peter Emmerich, and Doug Quigley on the road to Boston. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks. Everybody.